Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ultimate Autographs podcast. We are here in the Ultimate Autographs studio. My name is Donnie Rollins. Sitting to my left, Mr. Uh, my name is Adam Johnson. And to my right here. And I'm Griffin Sassano. And we sort of started this podcast as not to be a very sports-focused podcast, kind of like everybody is doing nowadays. We're a sports podcast that's going to emphasize in the memorabilia industry. So we're a podcast from guys inside the sports memorabilia industry for the sports memorabilia industry. And and Adam, I know you're big into cards. Yeah, not only are we all involved uh, professionally in the the sports memorabilia industry, um, I think all three of us come to this podcast with uh, experience well before we started in this industry, and also, you know, we currently are fans and we participate in the industry um, as well. So uh, we're bringing our collectibles and uh, sports memorabilia, no- memorabilia <laughs> knowledge to uh, the table, and uh, we're going to cover some um, some hot topics in sports, but not only just in sports in general, but uh, also for focus on the the collector in mind. So. Sure. I mean, to to be a collector, you have to have avid sports knowledge. It's just something that goes hand in hand. You don't want to you don't want to collect a bunch of things that you think are great right. if you have no sports knowledge and, and they could be worth you know nothing and griffin i know you're a big chargers guy you're starting to get into the memorabilia a little bit more yeah i'm not as uh experienced as as you or, or adam but uh i did collect cards when i was younger also collected those little riddell pocket pros <laughs> like i tried to get as many uh conferences from college football teams as i could i had like the full nfl set um i just yeah i just very uh your collection Very, is currently growing. Well, yeah, it's sure. Growing. Yeah. I did. I did just purchase a uh, LT blackout authentic helmet yeah, yesterday. Yeah, there you go. Those, those Riddell blackout. Yeah, those are yeah. Those are hot. Riddell flat, flat yeah. blacks are pretty sweet. Yeah. So our goal here, and really before we start to get into everything here, is is we want people that are either new to the memorabilia industry to really start to catch on and really start to to gather ideas from us, being that we've been in the memorabilia industry before, and guys that are, have been in here for a while, guys that do card breaks or do helmet breaks and things like that. We want people to sit here. We want people to enjoy what we have to say, even though they may be a little bit more knowledgeable than we are, because I'm sure there's people that are actually they're definitely people that are more knowledgeable than we are but we just want to have fun and this is is all about fun and we're going to talk about a lot of a lot of different topics going back to to memorabilia that's something that we want to do and and the first thing we want to talk about today is the nfl draft because that is is one of the staples of the nfl season and and it's right before things really get underway especially for us being such a, a a big for a big football oriented sort of sort of place you see the helmets here lined up in behind me so the nfl drafts coming up who goes number one and and sort of what does that do for their memorabilia intake yeah i mean uh i'll, I'll kick it off uh, but uh, i think uh the rumors right now have kyler murray going number one uh they got josh rosen there still who who is carrying a nice value in the, in right. the collector's universe as far as um his rookie cards you know contenders contenders draft and um, everything like that. He's, he's still going for a nice price even today, but uh, it sounds like uh, the connection with Kyler Murray in Arizona is a strong one with the, you know, the new coaching change. With uh, There's been some history, some quotes that people keep bringing up about uh, uh, the, the coach from Texas Tech who um, you know, has, a, has a liking for Kyler Murray. He said if he had the number one pick in the draft when he was the coach of Texas Tech, he would, he would be going after Murray. So I think, I really do. I think it's Murray. I think they find a way to move Rosen. I think I could see him going to Miami because Miami's depth chart's looking a little thin right now. Right. Um, as far as his value, I don't, I don't really even think that hurts Rosen um, going forward because I think he'll have more opportunity and a better opportunity than he has right now if he did go to, did go to Miami. So um, I, I like to see Murray go number one. I'd like to see the shakeup, and I think that would be a good move for everybody involved, including Rosen. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, his card value is probably a little bit higher than his memorabilia value because he really didn't do too much last season. And, and guys that do a lot of memorabilia like established guys mm-hmm. in the industry. You see guys that chase Brady, that chase Mahomes, that chase you know Philip Rivers and Drew Brees because those are established guys. So, Griffin, what do you think about who's going number one? I'm going to disagree. I think they're going to go defense, and I think they're going to go Nick Bosa, number Ooh, one overall. The first disagreement I, on the podcast. <laughs> I know. Very we, we first just topic. made some history here. <laughs> um, but I think they're going to go defense, number one overall. I think he's the best player in the draft. Just, you know, go Mel Kepper's big board. I'm going yeah. Nick Bosa, number one. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of agreement amongst the football community that he could be better than Joey. Um, you know, I'm a Charger fan, so I, I, I do think very highly of Joey Bosa, so that's saying a lot. Uh, I do think that 
they're going to keep Josh Rosen. I think they're going to give him the weapons that he needs. I mean, his offensive line last year might have been the worst offensive line ever assembled. Like, yeah. that's how bad the Arizona Cardinals offensive line is. So I, I don't really want to judge the guy based on his, his work here when he didn't really have much around him. Um, and then you compare him to a guy like Baker Mayfield, who had a lot around him in his first year. And then I know we like to talk about how um, first overall pick, you know, it, it impacts the the memorabilia uh, market for for said player. I think Baker Mayfield's uh, status only went up after being picked number one overall. He had a great year. Um, so then, I mean, like you said, Kyler Murray, same, he would be in the same situation if he went one one. Right. I think that's then going to depend on how he plays. And Baker Mayfield, you know, blew the doors off of kind of his expectations. Yeah, see, I, I like to think, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. I remember, you know, thinking at this point last year, yeah, you like that? That was nice. At this point last year when uh, people were saying, you know, Baker was a middle-round pick, second-round pick, you know, you, you believe it. I was always a Baker guy. I, I wanted to see him do well. Um, I, I, the higher the better, in my opinion. But when people started talking about, oh, he's going to be the number one overall pick, it's like, oh, my God, this guy went from being a mid-round pick. Right. You know, he did win the Heisman, but he was small. He was, you know, Russell Wilson, like he's a second, third rounder. And then it's like, oh, he's number one. It's like it just happened yeah. overnight. So same thing for me kind of happened with Murray. It's like he kind of started off being, you know, Heisman candidate. And he's like, oh, he's too small. He's a second, third rounder. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, he might be the number one overall pick. Right. So I've seen it before with Mayfield. So that's why I'm kind of feeling it with Murray because it's like we literally just saw this last year. So so, uh, you know, Arizona's worked him out. They brought him in. And again, if there's smoke, there's fire. So uh, I think I think Murray goes one. But if it was up to me, I'm keeping Rosen and I'm going with Bosa. That's a good call. I mean, I think, personally, I, I'm going to go a little bit of a dark horse. I think Arizona trades number one pick. Ooh, I, think, I think they're going to okay. trade the number one pick. Well, what do you get? What do you get in return if you're Arizona? I think you have to get top 10, offensive right? line. No, top 10 pick. You have to get offensive line for sure. Yeah. Because their offensive line, like you mentioned, is trash, a tragedy. Worse than um, it's worse than the NFL, probably. But you have to get established guys already, yeah. and you have to get another first round pick. You got to get I, picks. You got to get picks, I, I, and I you got to get, get a top ten pick. A team sure, three another top ten pick. Right. I think they they're going to go to like Oakland or something. I can well, see I them trying to make a trade Oakland for Oakland. Oakland has three, three Oakland first three. round Oakland picks. Has three. I, mean, I don't think this is a Green Bay move at all. They got two first round picks. I don't see Green Bay trading up to number one to, to do that, but. You never know. Aaron Rodgers' successor, <laughs> Kyler no, Murray. No, they would pick, they would pick <laughs> Bosa. Bosa. They would they go would Bosa. Go they would go. They would go a different route for sure. But there's multiple teams this year that have a lot of picks. Right. Um, and and think about this. There's been a little bit of heat between Carr and Gruden last year. I mean, Gruden was not really the biggest advocate of his starting quarterback. Right. So I think it's only good that they they make the trade and draft Kyler Murray. Well, I could be wrong, but I think Kyler Murray was at. He worked out, didn't he? He worked out for Oakland and it made a. Derek Carr a little bit upset. He Good. tweeted some subliminal things. There you go. So again, and you know, John Green loves his quarterbacks, and I think Kyler Murray is at the top of that list. So again, three picks. You never know. You use two of them. You trade up. You give them some veteran talent, like you said. But my, I'm curious to know if if Arizona did go defense number one. We haven't seen a defender go number one since Clowney, right? Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and Clowney's a guy who's out there. He's available now. He's not a guy who carries a super high value, but he's he's definitely got some worth. What do you think that does for Nick Bosa? Do you think he he comes out and he signs a lot? Do you think he maybe signs an exclusive with a, with a higher-end company? I think he'll automatically carry a ton of value. because Just for being that number one. Just for being the number one pick. Because, you know, when, when guys sign, they do inscriptions. Right. And, and Bosa can sign number one overall pick for the rest of his life. Right. It doesn't matter if he's an absolute bust. People will still want him because he's the 2019 number one overall pick. And and you see that with Mayfield. Even though he panned out really well, he still signs number one overall pick, even on Brown stuff. Right. So, I mean, that number one draft pick overall really carries a lot of value, especially for a defensive end. Because defensive yeah, guys nine, right. in the industry don't typically do it as well unless it's Lawrence Taylor or JJ Watt right. so my next question was if Nick Bosa does go number one does he carry as much value as like a JJ Watt kind of guy well I think like you said with that number one overall pick you got value there I mean I think companies will be jumping all over that trying right. to lock that in to you know uh, set their market for him but uh, yeah I think the defensive end like you said he's defense he's a defensive player but the way we look at who's worth it you know who carries that high value who's that high chase um, in the industry today, as far as football goes, defensive end is kind of the quarterback of the defense. I mean, right. You see a lot more defensive ends now with Watt, 
Um, I, I shouldn't say that too. A lot of outside linebackers like Khalil Mack, Khalil Mack, right? Von Miller, sure. Um, so a lot of those edge rushers. Let's call it that edge rusher. Oh, yeah, the blanket term they're they're right. using now. Right. So three four outside linebacker, four three DN. Exactly. Just screw we'll, that. It's just edge rusher. We'll call edge it rusher. edge rusher. The edge rusher is the value on the defense. Uh, right. Is where you see that. So I think uh, if you went Nick Bosa one, I think he carries that that solid value. Someone will be you know uh, not just someone, but a lot of people will be will be chasing that. Um, but as opposed to like a Quinn and Williams kid from Alabama on the inside. Side, yeah, I think Bosa is gonna, gonna sure. carry that high defensive value, just as if you know anyone else who went number one. I just think Jadavian Clowney, at, th- at this point in his career, he has kind of disappointed me with the numbers. Right. I think his numbers should be better for a guy that went one one. I think he honestly is kind of still living off of his name and then like the one one overall status. So Nick Bosa is gonna get. You know, just as many, uh, just as many opportunities for for signings and exclusive as Jadavian Clowney did, if not more, right. right off the bat. And then with his production on the field, I think that only goes up. I mean, right. Jadavian Clowney has been okay. I think he's done enough to earn the franchise. You got the franchise tag, I yeah. think, from Houston yeah. this year. Yeah, big deal. But I mean, would you guys agree with me? He hasn't really blown blown the tires off of kind of what what. He was expected. I mean, he hasn't been like amazing. He hasn't been amazing, like a number one overall pick. Right. You think would be amazing. But I think you forget that Jadavian Clowney did kill a guy on the field once. Yeah. He did he knock still, that guy. He still in the that too. Yeah. yeah but, I mean, yeah, it was in a right. Outback Bowl game. People right. people Michigan. expected him to come into the league and and do that on every down. Yeah. Which it's not really is is unrealistic <laughs> and sort of unfair in his point that he's capable of doing that and he's shown it. And just hasn't, but it's a whole different ball game. I mean, you could you can burrow through any offensive line in college if you're a stud defensive end, and then when you get to the NFL, everybody's at the same qual like the same quality and the, and the same caliber as you are. Right. He's dealt with some legitimate injuries too, which would hold anybody back. So I mean, you know. Bosa just sat out what the majority of this year with the yeah. abdominal tear injury. So right. it's in, I mean, that's got to be worrisome for some teams. That's I mean, that's really the only knock on the guy I've seen is that his he did get injured his last year. Yeah. So. That yeah. could uh, be enough to sway the Cardinals for to taking Kyler Murray, or they could get Quinn and Williams. I yeah. mean, so it sounds like they could go many routes. Mm-hmm. They definitely, I mean, they definitely could, and I kind of want to see Kyler Murray go number one, just because I, I I'm a big fan of a quarterback drafted number one. I think it does does very well for the press. It does very well for the NFL in general. Good when you see lines. when you see Good exactly <laughs> when you see when you see a quarterback go number one overall. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on that guy. Don't get me wrong, but. I just love the the storylines, like you said. I do love the storylines. I do love the hype around the draft. I do love the fans there when they cheer. Oh, you just drafted a quarterback number one overall to to take over and be the new face of your franchise. I don't think a lot of guys get too excited with the draft when they see a defensive end go number one. I think it can be limited as as a dud in terms of a draft if a defensive guy goes number one overall. But a while ago there, the the NFL draft, like a lot of the mock drafts had defensive guys in the whole top ten. Yeah. So you have to think it's about a it big from defensive from, draft. It is. I mean, you have to think about it from a line. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's huge in the defensive line, but you have to think about it from the from the standpoint of the NFL as a viewer. I mean, how many people, on average, watch the NFL draft? Millions of people. Do you think that that number goes significantly less if a defensive end is going to go number one and is set in stone? I don't think so. I mean, I think the NFL draft is going to be the NFL draft, and I think the NFL's done such a good job of marketing the draft now. You know, moving it from different city sure. to different city. This year, it's going to be in Nashville, which is a great place to experience anything. Um, so I think that draw will always still be there. And, you know, people want to see not only, you know, the quarterbacks and receivers get drafted in the first round, but they want to see mix-ups. You know, they want to see trades. They want to mm-hmm. see other teams shake it up. And like we mentioned earlier, a lot of teams this year with first-round picks, a lot of teams that are looking to rebuild. It's kind of a new era where these new quarterbacks are taking over. Mm-hmm. Teams are trying to find a new identity. So I think this is going to be a year where, yeah, you might not see the five quarterbacks go in the first round, but you're going to see a lot of teams moving up and moving back because they're going to they're all these teams are trying to find their identity. Again, Raiders multiple picks, Packers multiple picks. So it's going to be an exciting draft for for every team because teams will be moving all over the place and it'll it'll be shaking it up. Right. I mean, like like I just said, like the top 10 was just a ton of defensive guys, but not going from a viewership standpoint at this point, going from an ownership standpoint at this point, that's what you got to do to rebuild your team. you got to step up defense. I mean, it's such an athletic league now in the NFL. I mean, if you don't have the most athletic defensive guys, you're just going to get trampled. And I, I mean, agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm a Bears guy, so 
I just saw what the Bears did with Khalil Mack. I mean, sure. they were a eight and eight team at best. I mean, Vegas had them winning six games, you know, six and a half, whatever. But you get Khalil Mack, they rattle off 11, 12 wins, and you know, they probably could have made a better postseason run. Mm -hmm. But uh, that one guy who just totally transformed the defense just turn him into a whole different ball team. And so. already a very good defense. Exactly. I mean, even two years ago, you saw that the Bears had one of the best upcoming defenses right. in the NFL. And then you added a piece like Khalil Mack for draft picks, and everyone at the time was like, oh my God, it's fantastic. But now down the road, do you think that pick kind of hurts the Bears in terms of, of in their stock in drafts? As far as doing what? As far as as, far as, as, as rebuilding things that they, that they lack in right now, like offensive weapons, maybe like a wide receiver or, or, or a go-to running back? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think yeah, we saw exactly what happened last year. Khalil Mack almost seemed to be that missing piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, no team's perfect. They could always improve with right. high-end draft picks, but if I wouldn't change a thing. I'm happy with the trade in the first-round picks. I'm happy getting Mack. Um, you know, as we've seen in the past couple of years, you can find a running back, you can find a receiver in those middle rounds, which they have a couple picks there. So um, you almost need to build the the team in the first round with your D lineman, with your O lineman, with right. you know your field generals and the quarterbacks, and then you can kind of use your middle round picks to do the secondary, to do the receivers, to do the running backs, as we've seen in in years past. Right, like Jordan Howard was like a fifth round pick. I think the Bears are fine. I mean, anytime you get a chance to to trade for a player like Kylian Mack. Uh, if they give if they give up two first round picks, they didn't have two first round picks. Obviously, they could have done the twenty twenty. I think that might have been a little far, but a first and a second, that's fine. I mean, the guy's a uh, animal. The I think he was really the spark plug that kind of ignited the, the dominance that the Bears defense had last year. I don't think they're nearly as good without him. I mean, we talk about all the time just the guy being on the field doesn't necessarily have to make the play. Just his presence on the field, he draws double teams, frees ups mm -hmm. uh, assignments for other guys. Um, and like Adam was saying, that you can get. I mean, they they kind of need a running back. I'd like to see them get a younger, fresh guy. I mean, Mike Davis they signed, who's a, a good kind of plug and play guy. He can catch the ball. He can run the ball. Tariq Cohen, knock on him. Oh, he's so small. Can he run between the tackles a lot? Um, that remains to be seen. Even though Matt Nagy's not really using him that way. We've seen Nagy last year doing a lot of different kind of uh, scheming guys open, doing a lot of trick plays, stuff like that. Um, so they can do a lot, I think, in the middle rounds to improve their team and. I'd like to see them get a guy in the middle of rounds, third, fourth round running back, maybe Miles Sanders, Damian Harris, two guys to keep an eye on for the Bears. Yeah, stacked running back class this year. That's good. I mean, a lot but of talent. Like you mentioned, though, you can get a running back at any point in the draft and have him. You don't have your Leonard Fournette. You don't have your McCaffrey. Right. You don't have. have a, I mean, you don't have a Saquon league. Barkley. Like that's a right. top two. I mean, one overall. A lot mm -hmm. of people saying there's not like a. It's not front loaded right. with running backs, but there's certainly a lot of guys that you can get. That I mean, will be valuable not just to your team. The Bears' perspective, but any team that's looking for a running back this year, it seems like you know you put them all up on a dartboard, throw a dart, whichever one it hits. Right. There's plenty of talent to go around, so uh, every team should make it out all right with, right. Uh, with the running back. Whichever one sort of sort of runs into your offense yeah, is the best every, they can. Every team has a different scheme yep. now, so you got to find the one that fits yours. And a, a lot of teams draft around their schemes. Right. I mean, you're not going to pick a guy who's who's an only run guy if you're if you're the Patriots. You're going right. to pick a guy who can catch balls out of the backfield like we saw with Sonny Michel. He's great. I mean, he runs out of the backfield very well. And, and you look at the guys uh, you know who are on that roster for the Patriots. I mean, there's four running backs on that roster that all contribute. So yeah. it's not just, hey, you're our 20 carry a game back anymore. It's, hey, you catch five passes, you block 12 times, right. you run it up the gut five times, and everyone has a different role. Yep. So teams are evolving, schemes are evolving. So that position has pushed itself into the middle rounds now because it is such a team oriented position inside of a team. Sure. Um, that That's, I think, why we're seeing those, those, those picks drafted where they are. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, the Patriots are a perfect example of, of, again, the running backs being like a dime a dozen. You got guys like James White, who was very good two years ago for the Patriots, yeah. drafted Sonny Michel, and he just fits right in the system. Right. So, I mean, you can draft a running back, like we were mentioning, the third, fourth round and have it pan out perfectly. Right. And you guys, guys like Rex Burkhead, who can step up and be a big player on the Patriots, Super Bowl winning team. No one's ever heard of Rex Burkhead before this He's season. He's a Nebraska guy. I'd give him some credit. <laughs> he, he was he had he had a he had a history. He was with the Bengals before he was with the Patriots, but yeah. Someone someone who wasn't an avid football fan. For sure. No, isn't a big not, Rex Burkhead. He's, he not knocking really, Rex. He didn't at all. make his name until he, he went to the Patriots. That's for sure. Right. But um, yeah, I mean they can they can be found. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So sort of sort of sort of transitioning now. We can all agree that football. In the memorabilia industry is probably the most dominant. Easily. King right now, it's King. it's I think over the last couple of years um, that we've been involved, um, football's at its peak. I mean, everything a couple of years ago was evenly spread out. You know, everyone had their own special thing. Football, by all means, is taking over. 
Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's guys that that will chase Brady helmets forever. Brady helmets, Mahomes helmets, Drew Brees helmets. Just cleaning out the closet of all their rainy day funds to right. try to bring in a Brady helmet. Patrick I mean, Mahomes. I mean, you just said it. That guy is as hot in the memorabilia industry as as really you can get. Right. Um, we were at the uh, the GTSM show a while New ago. Jersey, yeah, yeah, in New Jersey, exactly. and. Um, the lines were just crazy for Patrick Mahomes. I mean, everyone wants that guy sick. I mean, sure. it goes back to our you know draft discussion where how long were the lines for Darnold? How long were the lines for Mahomes? I mean, these young quarterbacks they they're drawing a crowd. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not even in the memorabilia industry right now. Pat Mahomes, even in cards, he does fantastic in cards. People will buy boxes and boxes and of cards just to pull Mahomes rookies, they're still not even autographs. Chasing the 2016 series, you know, sure. there's not much left anymore. I mean, if yeah. it's, it's pretty much everything's been open because you're looking for that Mahomes rookie. And even boxes that that were less than a hundred bucks right. for like a for like a hobby box is now over a hundred. Rated rookie. Like, people are chasing those. Like, right, like no the other. the Panini classics. Are all over one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars now, just for the box, right. just to pull him a Mahomes that isn't even maybe autographed, just to right. pull that Ricky card. Yeah. So that's something definitely that that I don't know if will increase over next year because Mahomes was a breakout player last year, absolutely. So does Mahomes autograph kind of go down after this year, depending on? Not if he throws 50 touchdowns. Again. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, pretty just, much if he just stays half of what he was last year, he's going to be up there with the Breeze, the Rodgers, the Brady's. Well, mm -hmm. maybe not Brady. Brady's in a class of his own. But right. the Rodgers, the Breeze, the Manning brothers, you know, guys like that. Eli? Eli. Eli's got, you know, he's a New York guy. He's got a big he's market. Sure. two he's, Super Bowls. I mean. He's, he's definitely, he's got a he's got a price. Absolutely. I mean, people chase Eli autographs all the time. If you're a Giants fan, you love Eli Manning. Well, maybe not as of recent. Right. But. But you are generally an oh, Eli sure. Manning I mean, kind of guy. He's a borderline Hall of Famer. Yeah, I mean that's that's not that's a, a discussion for another. Day. Yeah, we'll save that for the next yeah. for the next week. Um, Eli Manning, a guy who never really signs, someone who we really never see doing like an autograph signing that he'll visit the public and things like that. Well, quarterbacks are tough to get. I mean, a lot of these quarterbacks are wrapped up with their exclusive deals. Eli being, uh, I believe, a Steiner guy, um, so they you know they limit their their signings, which is which is good. I mean, you know, do what you can to, 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 to make that uh, work. But, uh, yeah, I mean, guys like Roethlisberger, we just recently saw him come and start to come back a little more as, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as a signer, signee. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's guys out there who are a lot tougher to get than others, but the quarterback position definitely is one of those positions that sure. the guys – are harder to get. And that's the biggest chase for memorabilia collectors. I mean, if, if you want something that will hold value, quarterbacks, I think, if yeah. they're established, will do that more than, than any other position player on the field. Skill players, yeah. also, I mean, running sure. backs, starting running backs, starting receivers, even, I mean, now tight ends over the last half decade has started to become a, a bigger part of every single offense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we see a couple tight ends every single year kind yeah, of like burst a, onto the scene. Like a Gronkowski or Tony Gonzalez. I was like thinking George Gates. Kittle. I thought of I was thinking yeah, George goes, Kittle so. this year. George yeah. Kittle this year, and he's burst onto the scene, and now he's starting to gain some traction in the memorabilia industry. Like, right. oh, George Kittle, who's this guy? Yeah, we just he's saw the new him tight end. CSA, the yeah. CSA show in uh, Virginia. Yeah, Chantilly. he's the new tight end on the block. So, yeah. you know. Well, these guys are built like receivers now. I mean, they're basically glorified receivers i mean right. the tight end position is so different i mean if you're a tight end that blocks you're a totally different guy. maybe a little extra girth on the bicep measurements right. if you're a tight end a couple inches tall <laughs> like, i mean if you're if you're a blocking tight end you are a blocking tight end those the tight ends that go out and, and you know run those routes are that's what they're there to do and if, you, if you can find a, a guy that can do both i mean gronk amazing blocker Gron gronk is pass catcher not a great tackler <laughs> not a great tackler at the, all. The not, not a Miracle. great tackler right. at all. Right. Wow, that was bad. That was yeah. ugly. That was just. If you're a Patriots fan, you want to kind of just block that out of your mind. They did. They have too many. Yeah. They did. They, they did block it out. Good things. I think it worked to be out. occupying the think, uh, think, think it worked that. out. I think it did all right later yeah. down the road in the season. But yeah, I mean, tight end is definitely like you said something that has transpired to be more of a skill position. Before it was block first, block first, right. outlet pass right. for a tight end. Todd Heap. Yeah, like Todd Heap, like like guys like that. Like they'll just now you have tight ends that line up in the slot right. and go out for, and for short routes and even post routes, deep routes. You see Gronkowski 
go for jump balls all the time, like down the sideline. Corner of the end zone. Yeah, I mean, tight ends previously had never done that kind of stuff. And I think it's awesome to see because it opens up another option for quarterbacks to just succeed and, and really run well. Because most of the time, a tight end will, will come out in the flat and be guarded by a linebacker that they can probably outrun now. Which mismatch. never really <laughs> happened previously, right? It's a mismatch now, which before it was like, oh, okay, I could guard the tight end. I could take this play off. He's probably relatively slow. Now you have to guard a guy like George Kittle who's lightning quick. It, it just it takes a certain kind of player that are very few and bar, far between in the NFL. I think we're going to start seeing more of them, uh, kind of like a hybrid safety linebacker position to be able to cover these more athletic tight ends. It's right. like before tight end, the big problem with covering them was the size. Now you have to deal with the size and the speed. Yeah, a guy like true. David Njoku, uh, O.J. Howard, those sure. are kind of the new hybrid tight ends. I mean, they're big and they're fast. Right. So I'm just speaking from, you know, what I've seen this year, Derwin James, a guy in the Chargers, obviously being a little biased, but he did a great job this year of covering tight ends. He's that new kind of hybrid safety linebacker guy. So I think we're going to see a lot more players like him come into the league. Uh, more teams covet players like that to be able to take away these tight ends. Yeah, I mean, that that's I think it's great for the game, too, because it really starts to show off how athletic some of these guys are, even on the defensive side of the ball, guys that are just there to rush the quarterback. Hey, snap, rush the quarterback. Now they get to drop back in coverage, really learn the playbook a little bit more and, and start to show off their versatility a little bit. I think it's great for the game. Yeah, I honestly 100%. do. Makes it more exciting. That's for sure. Nobody's I mean, just gonna adds it. About points. I mean, right. We want to see yards. We want to see sure. points. So, yeah. Bring on the tight ends. Right, unless you're a defensive coordinator. <laughs> yeah. Then, then you don't want to see any points. So, but uh, another point that we want to kind of bring up about that transition, um, we're going to talk a little bit of MLB. And right okay. now, a couple teams, one of the biggest points that I wanted to make, a couple teams that were highly coveted to come in, into the season this year and just dominate, like guys like the Yankees and the Red Sox, the Cubs, who have been top of the NL Central for quite a while, and the Rockies, another team who made the playoffs last year, all off to super rocky starts. The Yankees, 5-7. No and seven. Yeah, that was good, huh? Thank you for catching that. The Yankees, 5-7. and seven. The Red Sox are 3-9 and nine to start the season. The Cubbies, 3-8, and eight, as much as it hurts us all to say, as we're all Cubs fans. No bias at all. And then the Rockies... <laughs> Sitting at three and nine, like a team that that was a, a tough playoff contender, oh, they really made the playoffs nine? three and nine, and I missed and they that one. and they just signed Arenado to that huge deal, yeah, which they should have. He totally deserved absolutely, that. and they got guys like Charlie Blackman who are also just freak athletes. These right. guys that are really are really sort of maturing that center field position as, right. as to more of an athlete like a Mike Trout. I mean, that guy could play any sport professionally if he wanted to. He just gets paid a whole lot of money to play baseball. So that's awesome. But then you've got teams that are like the, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays that are 10-3 and three to start the season. And then you got you got the Mariners that are 13-2 and two and just set a home run record, like teams that are just coming out of nowhere. And then the Braves with arguably the best lineup in baseball that are tied for their division right now. But going back on the bad teams, like when is it time to really sit down and think, okay, what do we have to do to change I think it's still still too early, you know. I think uh, you know we see the records what they are now, but as the season goes on, you know, 25, 30, 35 games in, it'll start to even out. I think a lot of uh, a lot of teams, you know, have expectations, and again with social media and um, all the st- different outlets out there, teams have expectations. So these teams that are playing tight, like the Cubs, like the Red Sox, you know, coming off a World Series, right? They uh, come out almost maybe trying too hard. I mean, they have the talent, the name on the back of the jersey. Um, proves the point of who, what that team is made of. I mean, they, they are stacked with talent. Where guys like the Mariners and the Rays, they don't have any expectations. Nobody was counting on them to be good. So they're playing loose. They're doing what they've been doing their whole life, and that's playing baseball. So I think uh, when you know the dust kind of settles and the, the beginning of the season kind of evens out and these guys ease into their roles again, mm-hmm. I think we'll start to see those teams at the bottom start to climb and those teams at the top maybe start to show who they really are. Um, but uh, it's only a matter of time. Before. I think we see this every year. I think the, the front runners always start low, and then you know some of the this team that's supposed to finish last in the division, they're top of the division, but mm-hmm. as time goes on, it, it'll all even out. I mean, these teams are too talented, Red Sox, Cubs, Rockies, to not. Yeah, I at mean, least climb a little bit, right? They're they're not gonna they're not gonna dig themselves too big of a hole. No. They just won't let it happen as an organization, right? Exactly. I'd say out of those, what do you say? Four teams. We got the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Rockies, Rockies, and the, Yan- and, the, and, the, and, the and the Cubs. Right. Out of those four teams, I would be most concerned about the Rockies. I think their division this year yeah. is a lot better than people think. I think the Padres could be doing something this year yeah. with all the different acquisitions they've had in the off season. The young guys like yeah. Fernando Tatis Jr. Yeah. is going to be a star. Yeah, uh, Urias, even, good ball player. Even the Giants aren't going to be 
this bad, I don't think. But they still have the year. Longoria. Yeah, they Longoria. still have they still veteran help. guys. Yeah, they still you have know? veteran guys, and then right. obviously the Dodgers are going to be there, and the Diamondbacks too. I don't. I think that the Rockies are going to have a tough time making the playoffs this year after they made with the wild card game last mm-hmm. year, beat the Cubs in the wild card game. And um, then the Cubs too. I'd probably say they're next behind the Rockies in terms of concern. Sure. Um, they just it's plain and simple. It's got to start playing better. I mean, the guys yeah. that they have, the bullpen. They're, they're trusting him, and they're just not performing right now. The offense is fine. Jason Hayward's on pace for 60 home runs. And then we like to do yeah. – we like <laughs> scrolling through Twitter, and on the first couple of days of the MLS season, be like, Tavi Baez is on pace for 500 home yeah. runs. <laughs> just, um, that's why you were saying earlier, you know, I give it for all these teams at the end of May if they're not starting to play better and if they're not all within five games of the division lead, I think then maybe it's starting to – be time to to be a little bit concerned for the Cubs. It's it's the bullpen, obviously the the, the blown leads within the first week of the season, uh, and then yeah. the starting rotation also getting a little bit older. I mean the Cubs are not exactly on the pitching side of things. They're not exactly a young team, uh, so see how much these guys have left in the tank. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah, I mean one thing that I wanted to bring up too for like the the bad teams last year that have really taken off in terms of autograph stuff. I mean, guys chase the big names on the big teams. Right. So it does really well right now for the autograph memorabilia side and the card side if the bad teams are doing better. Yeah. Because now guys chase guys from the Mariners like Blake Mitch Hanniger or something crazy like that. Domingo, like, Domingo Santana you know, leading like, the AL and RBIs. Or I think maybe leading the MLB and RBIs. Like that just that just helps out the entire MLB in terms of like their card stock and things like that. Their True. their Brings their balance. their stock. Exactly guys like that, guys you would never even try to chase before will explode this season right. and then the Otanis will die down. The Trouts I mean will probably never die down. Right. But then you guys guys like you know Javi Baez that people chase last year because right. he was a stud and now you're looking instead you're you're going in the direction of Mitch Hanniger from right. the from the Mariners who's you're loving Yelich because you know Milwaukee yeah. small market nobody's chasing Brewers right you're from Milwaukee but when Christian Yelich wins the MVP that's something to look for you know you right s- you see that in the breaks you see the Brewers now they're they're up there in price yeah, they keep going up and the pick your teams what, depending on what you're breaking um you know the Brewers sometimes are up there so um I I, I agree I think that's awesome yeah. I think it brings you know, like I just mentioned Blake Snell I mean the one of the better pitchers in the AL uh, pitching for Tampa, you're not oftentimes chasing Tampa Bay. He's another guy too, where you know you go back to his rookie year and you start opening those boxes, cracking open those boxes, yeah. looking for those rookies, those rookie autos. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with that point. You know, I never really thought of it that way. But to bring balance, when there's balance between small market and big markets in professional sports, it almost brings more balance to the collectors exactly industry because yep. not only are you chasing the big markets but there's also a reason to go after those small market teams as well sure i mean like you just said blake snell like cy young winner does anyone did anyone realize like outside of baseball that no oh, if you ask some guy in the street oh who won the al cy young winner uh justin berlin <laughs> if you gave him like, 20 guesses i don't even exactly i mean these these guys from these small market teams i mean if they can take like, Blake like snell one year right. great year if he can keep this up it's only going to help like we've been talking about the memorabilia industry kind of even out the market like you talked about like the Yankees and the Red Sox obviously those are always going to be high demand teams but if you get the Rays and the Mariners the Diamondbacks I mean those are teams that I mean, it could change the game for a lot of people, for sure. Right, absolutely. And now one of the teams that has emerged as a chase team, I'll use chase in in, in quotations because people chase whatever they want, but the Braves, Atlanta Braves, with one of the most stacked lineups in the MLB. You guys, guys like Acuna, who people chase all the time. People want his, like, Bowman Chrome rookies and Auden Colorados and things like that. Now Ozzie Albies just signed a huge extension today another guy who people chase because he's young. He's got a lot of upside. Those those two... (laughs) forever will be linked and they will have dual sign stuff yeah exactly I mean, they are a collector's dream if you're a Braves fan not only a Braves fan but just a collector mm-hmm. Albies and Acuna will be all over the place absolutely so, and then you sprinkle in guys like Freddie Freeman absolute right. stud like at bat like who was guy. the best player on the team yeah. for a while and kind of the only coveted guy on the team for a while you could still say well, he yeah. the best Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. and then you got like Brian McCann, like an older guy that right. people still want because right. either you're a Yankees good. fan or you know a guy who's been consistent right throughout the MLB for his career. That's just another team that you could chase, and you see like those pick your team prices go up a little bit for the Braves because they're a good right. chase team, and, and there's really no duds that come out of stuff that that are linked to the Braves. I think so too. I mean, this is a big year. Everyone talked about how big of a year it was last year for collectors with, you know, Acuna and Albies and a couple other guys, Otani. I mean, those guys were, their prices were through the roof. And honestly, I think that that year 
kind of brought a lot of people back into the hobby of collecting not only memorabilia but sure. specifically cards but I think this year too um, you know Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has been talked about forever you can almost group him in with last year's class because he was still being chased a lot mm -hmm. in a lot of these um, card series but uh, he definitely is part of this year's class or should be at least but there's so many guys especially going back to smaller markets that you know people are talking about like Padres Padres got a bunch of guys yep. Mets Mets are loaded they got Alonzo at first base who's just hitting homers left and right um, he's another one that wasn't totally on everyone's radar but he's he's been a prospect for a while um the white Sox, you know the white Sox got jimenez you know a former cub farmhand who we're pretty familiar with um he's started out a little bit slow but he's that's not going to stay that way forever they got a couple other guys in their minor league system we might see this year so again going back to that balance i think we're going to see uh, a lot of those rookies come up this year and just even make this already booming industry currently go even bigger when these guys start to hit the major leagues i think Right now, maybe more than ever, like farm systems are more chased, right? Because right? you got you guys like Eloy, you got like Michael Kopech from the White Sox as well, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who is going to be a huge chase this year. I mean, he's not even in the MLB he yet. He's the chase. Yeah, exactly. He's the chase. He's he's Mystery Redemption A right now. Yes, so exactly. That's a good reference. Yeah. Um, but I think like Flag Guerrero Jr., people will just will just buy every card just to try to get, even if it's an unsigned card. It's still super, super valuable. I mean, like you mentioned, the Padres guys like Lance Nix and, and Urias, who are just studs that are going to be studs. And those are guys that, that you invest in right now because their signatures can only become more and more valuable as right. they start to grow. Right. Um, so this at this point in the podcast we haven't had a chance to to do this yet but we want to we want to hear from the fans a little bit we want to answer fan questions and things that they have for us and we want to we want to know what fans of the podcast and fans of of sports memorabilia are doing what they're collecting right now what's their pc item so right now we're going to hear from adam and and griffin to see what they're pcing right now yeah. what 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 they're going through well, going back to me, I'm a huge card guy. Um, I'm a set collector. I like to chase, you know, the entire sets, whether it's just the flagship series of tops, top series one. Um, you know, Gypsy Queen just came out. I love Gypsy Queen this year. It's it's phenomenal. I think it's the best it's been in the last couple of years. Not so much for autos and stuff. I mean, it is what it is. But uh, I think the look of it this year is awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, any contenders through any sport, I love that chasing those rookie autos. Bowman, Bowman's about to come out. You know, that'll be a big one too. But aside from cards, um, you know, I'm a full size helmet guy. I like my full size helmets. That's what I go for. Yeah. I mean, Stuff like that. You, you know, we are all around them all day here, and it's it's hard not to just take them off. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I love it. Um, I got a couple couple of these IKEA shelves at home full of them, and <laughs> it's only going to continue to grow. So, um, yeah, I'm a Bears guy, I'm a Chicago sports guy, Cubs guy, so um, I'm always chasing those guys and, you know, the rookies and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, full size and cards right now, that's that's what I'm diving into. Heavy. I mean, that, that seems to be the direction that people are going in terms of their memorabilia collections. You've got full size helmets, which people display, and I've seen pictures of guys with Insane. walls full They're of They're all just blazed. They're all crazy. I mean, ice. some of these guys... I mean, unreal. It's really yeah. impressive what some of these guys like. That stuff could pay for the house right there with all their <laughs> with all their autographed really all their autographed memorabilia. Griffin, what are you what are you into? Um, I'm I actually really just started my <laughs> full size collection. Yeah, true. Yesterday, good we luck. talked about earlier. It's only downhill from you there. Know, I mean, yeah. I, I said you know, if there's one guy I'm gonna start it with and get an authentic, it's gonna be my guy, Ladanian Tomlinson, by far and away. My, probably my favorite athlete ever. I. I grew up a Chargers fan. He kind of was always my guy. I remember I grew up across the street from like a sports memorabilia store. Um, for some whatever reason, I just didn't never gravitate to the Bears. Um, and I saw this helmet in there one day. It was a lightning bolt on it. I didn't know what team it was at the time. I said to myself, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to save up all my allowance and get it. <laughs> so I bought it. It was a $90 uh, VSR rep. Wow. Um, back in the day, it was probably like 2002. Uh, the year after the Daniel Thomas was drafted, it was like 2001, I believe. Um, and then I looked up the team. It was the San Diego Chargers. Like, this is cool. They're going to be my team. L LT is their best player. And just kind of stuck. So, yeah, I got there the full-size uh, LT uh, authentic blackout. It's got the 2017 uh, uh, Hall of Fame inscription on there, 2006 MVP. So I was like, this is my guy. I'm going to go big for my first one. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's I a good those story. Blacks, those flat They're sweet. Especially with the uh, the Chargers with that lightning bolt over it. I mean, just it, pops. it stands it out. Pops that's one of sure. the ones of the flat blacks that definitely, like, you know, some are better than others, and I think that's in my top 
ten yeah. percent of those flat blacks. Those I like awesome. the I like the Miami Dolphins ones. I think the Dolphins colors yeah. over a black for some reason. If you can get like a neon paint pen oh, to go gosh. on a on a black or like an yeah. orange, like even yeah, you see the here with the right chrome, there, like, that say, looks awesome. Saw, it's an awesome I helmet. Saw cool, they did a really good job. A couple guys at the the GTSM show, they were doing the Marks Brothers with Marino. Yeah, and it was the the flat blacks, and then they did the Marks Brothers in like that neon orange, and the Marino was in the middle with like a teal. That That's awesome. Perfectly. Oh That's God, really like, cool. It looks so good. It almost looked like in a good way. It looked like crayon. That's how, but in a good way. You know, right. Like that thick, just perfect color. Sure. It was, uh, it was really, really, they sign really nice. When you get a nice color paint pen on those, even like the whites, they, they, they really pop. I love Mark Duper's autograph. Signs a super duper. Super duper. duper. That's, that's awesome. It's yeah. a great autograph. Yeah, it's, they're fun. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how they keep themselves popular in the autograph industry. I mean, right now, not of Miami Dolphins chases Mark Duper because no. it's just not a guy that you would look for right now. But if he's signing it super duper, that's awesome. Like yeah. that's something that it's I would cool. want or on any it with Dan Reno. You're, that you're, that yeah, might work that too. That too. might work too. But going back to like the Ladanian Tomlinson thing, a question that I just thought of, like how long could Ladanian Tomlinson be a valuable item for you? Do you think forever? For me, I, I know when I was, you know, looking through the stuff we had yesterday, <laughs> I was like, well, this is my guy. He's always right. going to be my guy. He's priceless to me. I mean, he's just he's my favorite player so i will continue to to seek out stuff for him and see what i can do maybe a frame jersey in the future i don't know but and i'm probably going to start my my full-size collection at least right now exclusively with chargers and then <laughs> see where we go from there but yeah he's he's really is priceless to me he's yeah, that's awesome player, so yeah, everyone's everyone's, everyone's got their guy like i have i have jerry west frame jersey on my wall there just because he's the nba logo i think he's, he's such logo, a man. he's such a trademark to the nba and i'm such an nba fan that i gotta have that guy how many you points know? would they have with the three-point line in play how many points how many would jerry points west average three-point line how many points would he have in his career yes a uh, 10 million 10 million he would at least have a ton more <laughs> than he does now but i mean i was like jerry west i mean and obviously 23 i've never seen jerry west play i've only seen like youtube highlights right. for some reason when i was younger i was always into jerry west and i was always into pistol p maravich like yeah. my two like go-to guys like from wonder watch basketball school. highlights wow. that's awesome i wouldn't watch like jordan or like kareem i would watch Pistol Pete Maravich, and I thought that's that's really interesting. interesting. So my next thing is to get Pistol Pete on my wall yeah. next to Jerry West. I mean, and then I have Scotty Pippen too because I'm a Bulls fan. I, I like the Bulls, um, their organization. As my life goes on, I'll always probably be a Bulls fan, even though sure. they're terrible right now, awful. For now. Fire Gar Pack. For now, <laughs> yeah, Fire. get him out. Easy. That's a hot take. That's a hot take. Get him out. He's got <laughs> fired. <laughs> but I just love the Bulls. So I mean, I just can't afford a Jordan jersey because they're all skyrocket. No, through the, yeah, I mean, unless Michael Jordan, he's probably the only guy who could afford. Well, you see too, they have uh, Haynes now came out with. Uh they're like coming out with like t-shirts or whatever their underwear where in each pack there's like a jordan card oh uh, like a trading card but 10 of them are autographed so i mean that's i mean that's whole another discussion i'm, I'm about to I'm buy a whole lot of buy, tidy whiteies yeah Haynes <laughs> to go to go chase that michael jordan card i saw that the other day and i thought that was i mean it just proves to how big this industry is sure. right now again not only memorabilia but cards i mean people Haynes is putting these I mean Michael Jordan's always been their guy but they haven't done this all the time so it's like I feel like they're playing into the craze of autographs right now too um, but yeah I thought that was super interesting that uh, that was their get to get their you know demographic to buy a product <laughs> like like here buy some underwear from us buy some tidy whiteies uh, and maybe get a Jordan autograph with it one of ten. I don't know about you guys, but I may head to like a Walmart after this is over yes, and just Target. Pick up, sure, pick up like are, twenty uh, pairs of Target underwear. Right there. There's but a Target the, like down the block. The way the industry <laughs> works now, it's by the time you get there, there won't be any. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, like, that's how true. How many times you show up and there's nothing left of the product? Some you're dude's for. gonna be like, "Give me all your tidy whiteies." It's gonna be. They're gonna have <laughs> the in the in the sports card section now. Like, I could. That's what people. I could see for. it. I could see it. Um, another another fun thing that we want to do here going forward is we're going to have a 20 questions segment here. So I have a player in my head and I want you guys to ask me 20 questions yes and no try to only. try to figure it out. It'll be yes or no questions only. We'll rotate starting with Adam. You'll go first. Griffin, you'll go second. I'm not okay. going to give you the sport. I'm going to give you nothing okay, we're teaming up to here. start it up. Okay. So, so Adam, if you want to start us up, I'm going to, I'm going to try to remember as much information about this one guy as I can. Okay. So go ahead. Um, I'm going to stick with what's big right now. Is he a football player? Yes. Was he a football player? He yes. Was. Okay. Is, is he is, he is, 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 or is slash was a football. So it could be current or retired guy. Yes. I don't know yet. That's your question. Yeah. Is he current? Or, is he current or retired? <laughs> it's a yes I can't, no. so can't it's, answer it like that fool. Is he current? <laughs> it's a yes or is, no. Is he, is he current? No. 
Okay, so he's retired. <laughs> so it, took you, it took you 45 questions to yeah, answer one. That counts as one, so we got two questions. <laughs> um, so he is retired. Okay. Um, 90s? 1990s? No. Wow. It, you should have this information. Wow. For you. Hold on. Yes, 90s. He is yeah. He is 1990s. So he's either yes. towards the end of the 90s or he's at the beginning of the 90s. He just spilled over. So he's okay. either... He's is played. he in the NFC? Yes. Well, no, technically, because you said is. Well, he, he was. <laughs> was he in the NFC? Did yes. he play for a team in the NFC? A current team in the NFC. What would be today's NFC? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. What? Adam? Yes, it was. I'm making it hard. It is NFC. It was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> was he a receiver? No. Did he play offense? No. Mm. I think it's eight. Eight questions. So an NFC player. I think it's NFC. I'm going to be so defense. embarrassed if it's not. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Played around the 90s. What did he play in the 2000s? They're in the AFC. They're in the oh, AFC. Wow. Jesus. I drew a blank on what <laughs> division. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I drew a complete first blank. podcast. They're in the <laughs> AFC. <laughs> AFC. AFC. Yeah. Defender that uh, <laughs> played D- an AFC defender that played around the 90s. You're laughing like I'm like you're. I'm loving it myself. Here. Okay. All right. That's fair. So he played around the 90s. Defender AFC. Is he Super Bowl champ? No. Did you answer my question? Was he in the 2000s? No. Jesus. Okay. So we got to go way back. Only 90s. So <laughs> only 90s AFC defender non-Super Bowl champ. I don't know if you said only 90s, right? I didn't. You did not confirm that. Right. So he could be 80s? <laughs> he could be late 80s? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Could be. Mm. Man. Mm. How many questions is that? 13? 12? <laughs> is he... <laughs> A defensive lineman. Yes. I kind of, I'm kind of starting to think defensive of a lineman. Name here. Now in the Super Bowl <laughs> for the AFC I think in the 80s and 90s. Should probably reference it a little bit more. You want, you have, you have a question? Because I have a good one. No, go ahead. I know, one? I know. I asked earlier. Did he ever win a Super Bowl? Did he ever play in a Super Bowl? <laughs> yes. Yes. I gotta research these guys a little bit better before <laughs> I start this. Okay, I didn't think about that one. Defensive lineman played in the Super Bowl, AFC. I think he played in the 90s. Bad at this game. I kind of want to start getting the team down here, but I feel yeah. Like we're mm-hmm. too take, far, a, take a shot at the team. I'd say take take a shot at the team. Three divisions. Four. No, four. Yeah, Shoot. Four divisions. Four divisions. Yeah. I better get the divisions. Um, um, I'm trying to think who's 80s and 90s. Who who were the Super Bowl teams? Then I mean, do you, okay, this is tough. Uh, I'm gonna go wild right here and just go on a limb and say, did he play for the Steelers? No. Mm. Yeah, Joe Green was before that anyway. I don't know. what I'm thinking. <laughs> so I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of defense. Well, I thought I was saying, that's actually it's not a bad defense. Guess. I was thinking like 90s, just Niners, Cowboys. Like those were just. But yeah, those are NFC. Those are NFC and he's AFC. <laughs> I feel like I stumped a schwab on this one. No. Um, I just don't know enough info about it. Is, I should have got a little more research. Uh, did he play in the AFC East? N- can you name the teams in the AFC East? Bills, Bills Patriots, Dolphins, Bills, Jets. Dolphins. Yes. I, think I, know, <laughs> I actually kind of want to guess who it is. I, I think I know who it is, too. Yo. Um, I believe, and if you had this information in front of you, you could confirm. Is he the all-time sack leader? Are we thinking of the same guy? Yeah. It may be uh, the old common inscription. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did he play on the Buffalo Bills? <laughs> yes. Is it Bruce Smith? <laughs> it's it is the all time sack leader, Bruce Smith. That, that a boy. Well done. Okay, that was it's awkward. It's that was awkward handshake. Right. But it's fine. Fine. It's all good. I don't know. It was the first person that I thought of in terms of how Bruce I could stump Smith? you guys. That was a good Bruce one. That's a good that was a good one. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. Just because he did play in the Super Bowl though, right? He did. Four of them. That's right. Four of them got lost. All knew he was on that team. Four falls of Buffalo. Yeah. ESPN thirty for thirty. Jim Kelly. Jim Scott Kelly, Norwood. Norwood. Scott Norwood. Andre Reed. <laughs> Andre Reed. Was Thurman Thomas. Thurman Thomas. Yep. Stack team. They were. They're, uh, they're the bill. Those guys do. They do their signings. Yeah, they do pretty well they for autograph well. signings yeah, and I things like, like that. Their their yeah. autographs will probably always be popular because of those teams. I, I can attest to that because I watched that documentary and was like, 
where do I get my Marv Levy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, he's like one of those names you don't really hear about too often, but um, you know, especially from our generation, but right. I watched that and like that guy is one of the coolest coaches I've ever seen. So yeah, he's I was awesome. all over Marv Levy as soon as I saw that. Just wasn't good enough. They were always good enough. I just still can't believe they didn't win <laughs> one of those. I, I mean, just one. one of those would have made I didn't get one. Buffalo. That's, that's so tough. Just, I, I know. Just, lose that's, four they're forever <laughs> yeah, remembered so for tough. that. That's so tough. And if they happen to win a Super Bowl, I think all those players will be talked about more than they are. I, right. I, I mean, people forget Bruce Smith, all-time sack leader, just because he's on the Bills. Right. Like, if he was on the right. Giants, like... If he was a, like, yeah, if he was a cowboy. Cowboy, like... Andre, I mean, those guys Bills. are all famous. Yeah, they're, they're all great, great players. They just played for the Bills. Yeah, yeah, it's just small market team. We kept talking about that. Yeah, like, just, bring the balance to here's yeah, a, sports. Here's the fun facts that I had about, about Bruce Smith before we started. So I have 11-time Pro Bowl. Eight-time All-Pro, so right off the bat, like just Great stacked smart. resume. I mean, that that enough gets you in the in the Hall of Fame. Then you have 1990 and 1996 Defensive Player of the Year. Yeah, in a, in a time where def, like defenders were were highly and recognized that's a, too. Think about a, de, a career, an NFL career. A lot of guys don't even make it three years. He won it in 1990 and then and lasted then, long then enough 96. to then perform well enough again and win in 1996. Right, that's, Aaron Donald just won it back to back. Right, but that's. Like you said, back to back to do it right. six years apart as a defensive lineman is is crazy. I mean, the shelf life for a solid defensive lineman not so much a shelf life, but just the amount of them being good. You know, their their Pro Bowl seasons is to be six years apart. That's pretty wild. I like that term, shelf life, for, <laughs> shelf for an athlete. I think that's pretty <laughs> cool. And then my last thing was that he was uh, the first overall pick in the 1985 yeah, NFL draft. Yeah, guys who, you know, we say defense going number one is boring, but clearly... This, this one panned out. He'll get you to four Super Bowls. This one panned out. He won't win you one. <laughs> yeah. but he'll get you there. He'll get you the dance. He won't dance. So maybe mm. Nick Bosa is the next... Uh, <laughs> Bruce Smith. Next Bruce. Is that, would that be like a goal for Nick Bosa? I think that'd be a goal for if, any. If he gets drafted, like, dude, I'm totally gonna be the next Bruce Smith. That's a that's a tall tall order to live up to. I, I bet he won't. Bruce Smith. He's well, yeah, take sure. the tape, take the team accomplishments out think, of it. Yeah. I feel like everyone would want to be. If Absolutely. you're a def- defensive lineman, that's a great person. Most people to, would trade their career, at lose four Super Bowls to be Bruce Smith. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty fair statement. I mean, yeah, like it's just just like you said. I mean, if Nick Bosa gets drafted, has half the career that Bruce Smith had, he's probably Hall of Famer. Oh yeah, and and that's just a guy that nobody really talks about anymore, Bruce Smith. That's why I kind of, I kind of brought it on myself to to bring him up in this podcast because his signature, it does doesn't do it justice. I think no. you know, someone who goes to an autograph signing isn't jumping for joy over Bruce Smith, but just look at his accolades. Right. You know, I think he kind of gets drowned out by current guys. I mean, would you guys I just agree? I think it goes back to the fact that he was on the Bills. I think that's really all it is. If I you think, if yeah. you put that guy with those numbers on the Cowboys. Or any other big market team, he is raking in the dough more than he is right now with <laughs> autograph signings. Yeah. I just, it, it just goes back to the fact he's on the Bills. He was on the Bills. And he played defense. I think you yeah. knocked because you played defense, and then you played for a small market. Buffalo. Yeah. You could be the best player in the world, and uh, markets matter. It does. You know? I like okay. People go there. Kind of changing, going off a tangent here, talking about like you know best players. Yeah. I had someone try and tell me that Aaron Judge was the best player in baseball. Like. Three weeks ago, I'm like, "Are you no. kidding me? Like, have you seen Mike Trout? Oh, I know I don't watch Mike Trout. He's on the West Coast. He's in the team like, photo, but yeah, Mike Trout is. But just, if you know baseball, it's by far and away the best player. best of all time. An example of being on a smaller market team. The Angels are the little brother to the Dodgers, and no one right. really watches the Angels. Thus, if you don't know baseball, you don't think Mike Trout's the best player. You're going to think some guy in the Red Sox or the Yankees is. I think there's a reason they moved from Anaheim to Los Angeles because I think they were kind of sick of being known as a smaller market when really they were kind of in LA the whole time ish but uh, yeah. Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim right LA so I think as a, <laughs> as a market you'd rather be considered LA as opposed to a suburb or not so much suburb but a, a city outside of LA in Anaheim yeah I mean I agree I mean Mike Trout if he were on the Yankees he would be making more money than he does now yeah. I think if that's I'm, possible. And I'm glad. I like to see all these guys getting their extensions with their with teams, the teams they, they stuck with. with. Right. Because, um, again, it brings balance to Major League there Baseball. There you go. When, and as opposed to everyone flooding to the east and the west coast to get their big contracts and playing in the big markets. I like to see them stay where they are. That's, that's I think that's good for the sport. I think it's good for everybody. Yeah. So 
We've talked a lot about the industry. We talked about memorabilia in general. We talked baseball. We talked football. We played 20 questions. We'll get some NBA talk next week. Yeah. And uh, we get a little bit closer to lottery. And we'll, playoffs uh, also. Playoffs. Yeah. yeah. The the corner. It's coming up. The I seeds wanna, are uh, set. The seeds will be set. Yeah. I want to get some set. I want to get some questions from fans. I want to see what what fans are PC. Yeah, I think that'd be huge. I mean, I think that would be a huge contribution to the show. The, you know, the more engagement we could get from fans as far as what they want to hear us talk about, you know, not only is us just personally as as fans but as you know we're a little bit more involved in the industry than most right. um so if we could hopefully give them some insight on maybe tips on hey sign the helmet this way don't use this type of right. pen use this on this type of item and, and different ways that we can help the community i think that's kind of what we're here for too is to uh get with the fans and see how we can make the experience of collecting um even better for them right i mean we're gonna we're gonna try to do a little bit of everything on here, but but one thing we gotta have some fan interaction. I think it's huge. So, for the first episode of the Ultimate Autographs podcast, Griffin, Adam, we want to thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys next time.